going to ask that you would open your Bibles. Church, let's do a Bible study, and I'm excited to be in Revelation chapter 20. I just think it's so important that we look at latter-day events and understand how all of this ends. What a mess this world is in, but it ends victoriously, and we are so encouraged when we see it, when we read about it. Revelation 20 is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because at the end of all of this mess, he comes to rule and reign. The title of our message, Justice Will Prevail. Justice Will Prevail. Let's pray and then look to God's word. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for sending it forth in power by your Holy Spirit and using in our lives. We open our heart to you. God, show your strength and power through the victory that comes in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. At the end of the great tribulation, and much of uh, the book of Revelation discusses that seven-year tribulation period uh, of God's wrath. That's really what it is. It's describing God's wrath poured out on an unbelieving world. At the end of the great tribulation period, the Lord Jesus Christ comes in great victory. We spoke of this last week, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, this is very important. When the Lord comes at the end of the tribulation period, he will defeat the armies of those nations that have assembled in the Jezreel Valley, near Megiddo. North, it runs north and northwest of Jerusalem. The great armies of the world will gather to destroy in one last attempt to destroy Israel. But the Lord Jesus intervenes. This is known as the Battle of Armageddon as the Lord himself saves Israel from her enemies and reveals himself to be the Messiah. And I'll tell you, there's so much to understand about that. Read Zechariah 12, 13, 14. It's just amazing what he describes in tremendous detail about the end of the age. Now, it tells us in those chapters that when Christ returns, that at the end of the tribulation period, that he will set foot on the Mount of Olives and then he will enter Jerusalem. And he will enter Jerusalem, setting up his throne there to rule and to reign, to shepherd the nations, you might say. And it says that he will do so with the rod of iron, which is to say he has tremendous power and authority. And when he comes, he will come to set things right. I'll tell you what, that is a great encouragement because there's so much wrong. There is so much wrong in this world, and Christians can sense it. How, how this world is broken, and I'll explain why this world is broken. Of course, we know we can attribute it to sin, but also to spiritual warfare in regards to our enemy. And that's what this message is about. Justice will prevail over the enemy and over this world. He's going to come to set some things right. Is I tell you what, there's so much wrong. And here's the thing. Everybody can sense there's so much wrong in this world. Yet, many people think it's right. Many people think it's good. That which is wrong, they call right. That which is bad, they call good. That reminds me of Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. The Lord says through his prophet, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's a messed up world, he's describing. And I'll tell you, it describes the world in which we are living today. My goodness, everything is upside down. Uh, People, it's just amazing. Things need to be set right. That which is good is bad. That which is bad is good. I was thinking of a a lighthearted, somewhat humorous, (laughs) I say somewhat humorous example all of my humor is somewhat humorous. Uh, <laughs> when, I, when I was growing up, you know, every generation, it seems, has their own slang, you know, their own expressions of their generation, right? When I was growing up, we had our own slang also, but our slang made sense, right? I mean, words like hunky-dory, that makes sense, right? Or gee whiz, that was when I was growing up, I was a kid right? Gee whiz, hey, that makes sense. Or holy smoke or groovy. That was part of the 60s. I know about the 60s. I read about the 60s. And the, the, the word groovy, that makes sense, right? You're in the groove. That makes sense, right? Far out, that makes sense. But today, today I'm telling you things don't make sense. 
So if something is good, if something is good, then the words to describe it are like, oh yeah, that's bad. Oh, that's sick. Oh yeah, that's killer. Oh yeah, that's wicked. Wait a minute, those, that means good? Is that good? Yeah, that's good. That means it's good. That's wicked. That means it's good. Oh yeah, that's bad. Oh, that means it's good or bad. That's bad. It's good. No, that's good. It's like, this is crazy. It is, right? Come make sense of all that. Just a humorous illustration. See, today there's so much that's the opposite. You know, I, and I love the expression, Jesus will come to set things right. The world system is messed up. The world system is messed up. There's so much that's wrong and broken. But the world system will be destroyed. Nations will be defeated because he'll come to rule and reign. But there will be one more thing that will need to be set right. In fact, I think we could even say it this way. When Jesus returns at the end of the age, when Jesus returns to rule and reign, you might say the world will be under new management and a whole new system. And I think every believer in the world says, oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. You know, Satan is now called the ruler of the world. Jesus referred to him in that term in John 14. He's called the ruler of the world. Now, also, when the devil tempted Jesus in Matthew 4, tells us that he took Jesus to a high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, he's, uh, the, the devil said to Jesus, all of these he would give him. He says, all of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And of course, uh, uh, Jesus answered with scripture, worship God and worship God alone. But here's the thing I want you to see. The devil offered these to Jesus because they were his to offer. The kingdoms of the world were his to offer. All of these I will give to you, part of that. At the end of the age, he will rule and reign. And Satan will be defeated. He will be removed. I tell you, that's going to be a wonderful day for the world. But I want us to see, as we read through these verses, I want us to see that there are tremendous applications right here for us in these verses. As we look through these, let's read it. Revelation chapter 20, we begin in verse 1. We're just going to read the first five verses. And I saw an angel... Coming down from heaven, having the keys of the abyss, the abuso, the abyss. This is the place. Do you remember when Jesus in the Gospels came upon this man, Legion, who was uh, the, the demoniac, we say, because he was filled with a legion of dem demons. And, and Jesus confronted them. Do not cast us into the abyss, they said. That was a great, great fear. Do not cast us into the abyss, please. They pleaded with Jesus. Instead, they asked to be cast into the herd of swine. But he says here that this angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. Like he could not be more clear who he's referring to here. And he bound him for a thousand years. Now, there's a reason he's referring to it as a thousand years. We're going to get to that in the, in the next uh, set of uh, messages on this. But it says in verse 3 that he took hold of that dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years, and verse 3, threw him into the abuso, into the abyss, and shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive the nations any longer because he's a deceiver and a liar. He says, until the thousand years were completed, after these thousand years, he must be released for a short time. Again, we're going to get to that. That's another critical aspect of Latter-day events. Verse 4, and I saw thrones. And they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast 
or his image and have not received the mark upon their forehead or upon their hand. And they came to life and they reigned with Christ, reigning with Christ for a thousand years. Now, that's another aspect. I want to look at all this. It's very important that we see the application. Verse 5, and then the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Later, we'll hear about the second resurrection. I want us to look at these verses and apply them to our life, starting with this very important understanding. Satan is a defeated enemy. Let's start with that. Satan is a defeated enemy. You know, in the, in the uh, Star Wars movies, the, the popular Star Wars movies, uh, evil and good are depicted as, as in, the, in balance, right? The force must be in balance. I can't say it right, right? And, and, and there's this epic battle of forces, and the outcome is far from certain. The dark side of the force, the good side of the force, but the force must be in balance. I'll tell you what, that's the stuff of movies that is not accurate. Please don't get your theology from such movies. It's not accurate. There is no force of balance. That's Star Wars. The reality is this. Satan is defeated, and he is a defeated foe and was defeated by the victory that Jesus already won for us on the cross. All that was against us was nailed to the cross and he defeated death so that all the condemnation that was due to our sin has been paid and paid in full. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 is a tremendous promise. Now, here's the thing. We're looking at this now. Know this. He is a defeated foe. However, notice this, that though defeated, he fights on. Though defeated, he fights on. Now, at that time, when God's determined time comes, as described here in Revelation 20, when Satan will be thrown into the abyss, notice, would you, that there's no epic battle of massive forces. There's no no epic battle of, uh, of whatever. There's no, he sends one angel and one angel with the key to the abyss and a chain. That's it. It's important to recognize. Then he's bound, then thrown into the abyss. Also, I think it's important to note by this time, when this event happens, the Antichrist has already been defeated. When you get to Revelation 20, the Antichrist has already been defeated. And also, the false prophet, already been seized, thrown into the lake of fire. I remember I was teaching on this one time, and someone asked me a question. They said, well, if Satan knows, if Satan knows that he cannot win, if he knows that he cannot defeat God, then why does he keep fighting? Well, that's a good question. But let me give you the answer. Number one, because he will seize whatever opportunity he has. He will seize the opportunity. He knows he has only a short time. So he will make all that he can of that short time. Notice Revelation 12, verse 12. Woe to the earth and the sea, it writes, because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. And he's going to try to make whatever he can out of that, out of that short time. Also, why does he keep fighting? Because he said, so he can destroy as many as he possibly can. You might call it the scorched earth strategy. He knows he's defeated, but he's going to take with him as many as he can, and he's going to destroy as many as he can, because the more he destroys, the fewer there are that worship the Lord. That's his strategy. John 10, verse 10, the thief, Jesus says, come only to steal, kill, and destroy. I was thinking of an illustration, you know, back in World War II, when the Allied forces invaded Normandy, June 6, 1944. On that day, 155,000 Allied soldiers fought in the greatest single invasion in world history. From that point forward, when the Allied forces took the beach, at that moment, Hitler knew 
the war would be lost. He knew he was a defeated uh, 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 leader. But even though he knew he was defeated, he continued fighting to the bitter end, refusing to acknowledge defeat. Satan knows he's defeated, but he will also fight to the bitter end. Notice Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Peter 5, 1. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Still today, he is seeking someone to devour. Also, would you notice this in regard to the enemy? He deceives the nation. He's described as the one who deceives the nation. And I suggest to you that he is deceiving the nations today. When you look around what's happening in the world today, we are seeing the influence of satanic forces. He is influencing the nation today. The, I tell you, the greatest, most powerful thing that Satan does is to deceive. It's a weapon. Lying is a weapon. It's a weapon of his warfare. Notice what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, referring to him. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's his nature. It's, it, this, to deceive is a weapon of warfare. See, notice in verse 3, notice in verse 3, it says, when Christ comes to rule and reign on the earth, Satan must be removed so that he can deceive the nations no longer. And I tell you, there's a very important practical application to your life right now. And it's this, beware of the schemes of the enemy. Beware of the lies of the enemy. Be able to discern when you see or hear a lie, that which is a deception. Be aware. There are they're the main weapons of his warfare. And I tell you, this is tragic, but many are defeated. Many today are defeated because of the lies of the enemy, the lies of the enemy that are used to defeat you. Can I give you some? If I, I want to call them out. Let's bring them out into the light so we call them for what they are. Here's a lie, the enemy. You cannot be satisfied unless you have more. Right, that plays right into the flesh that's never satisfied. It plays right into the flesh that's never satisfied. It's a lie. It's a lie behind drugs. It's a lie behind worldly sexuality. It's a lie behind the lust for power and for greed. It's a lie behind much that drives the world. Let me give you a great uh, set of verses. Psalm 73, and I have a bunch of verses I put together for the, the sake of being succinct. But here's Psalm 73. As for me, the psalmist writes, it's, it's a really good psalm. As for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps almost slipped because I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In other words, he, he said to himself, doesn't seem like, it says like uh, the wicked, they're not in trouble like other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Seems like they have the advantage. So he then, he concludes, he says, surely in vain have I kept my heart pure when he considers this. Now he's going to correct himself, but just follow. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. Surely in vain have I washed my hands in innocence. For I've been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. When I pondered to understand this, when I pondered this, it was troublesome in my sight. This was troublesome to me. And I think that there are many who look at the world and they see the, 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 the prosperity of the wicked and they are troubled in their spirit. What's the sense of this? He says, that is, wait, uh, that is, that is, until I came into the sanctuary of God. I love that phrase. Until that is, I came into the sanctuary of God and then I could see it. I perceived their end. I could see it then. Surely, he says, surely now I see. Surely you set them in slippery places. 
Surely you cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they're destroyed in a moment. Then he says in a tremendous statement of faith, you have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? What a great statement. And besides you, I, I desire nothing on this earth. Ah, I love that statement. Besides you, Lord, I desire nothing on this earth. God is the strength of my heart. God is my portion forever. In other words, once he perceived the Lord, it put it all right. It helped him to see it. All right, here's another lie. Let me just point out some of the lies of the enemy. Let's call them out for what they are. Here's another lie. You are unworthy of God's love. Here's the lie. You are unworthy of God's love. Now you might say, well, wait. I am unworthy of God's love. Here's the lie. The lie is you have to make yourself worthy. You have to somehow qualify yourself with worthiness before God will love you. That's the lie. Somehow you're going to have to, you want God to love you, you're going to have to be worthy of that love. I tell you, Satan is the accuser of the brethren and he will try to convince you that you don't deserve grace. You don't deserve grace. To which you should say, well, if I deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. Grace is that which is undeserved. See, the enemy wants to continually remind you, you are unworthy. Call it for what it is. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You are unworthy. And he will remind you of your, of your past. He will remind you of your past failures. I was thinking of an illustration. It's kind of a, uh, I don't know. Maybe funny, but also tragic. I, reminded, I was reminded of when I was in fifth grade. Fifth grade, okay, we're going way back in the archives now. I was in fifth grade class, and for whatever reason, I don't know how this happened, but the teacher apparently thought it was a good idea to have a student be in charge of enforcing all class rules. Now, why that's a good idea, I don't know, but she, the teacher, uh, uh, he, uh, set up this a situation where a student is going to be the enforcer of the sergeant of arms. Well, guess who was voted to be the sergeant of arms? Yes, it was me. And I'll tell you what, I am the enforcer uh, in fifth grade, okay? I'm the enforcer of the rules. And let's just say I took my responsibilities maybe a little too seriously. Okay, well, uh, let's just say that the other kids in class didn't exactly appreciate my zeal. <laughs> okay, so one day, it just so happens, by the way, just so happens that we were studying government, you know, in fifth grade. We were studying government and how government works and whatnot. And uh, at some point, uh, one of the uh, students in class came up to me and he said, hey, we are circulating a petition that wanted to see if you wanted to sign it. And I said, oh, really? What's it about? Oh, we're, uh, our petition, we're, we're asking for more recess time. Oh, we're asking for more recess time. Oh, yeah, sure, I would love to sign that petition for more recess time. So I signed it. And then they opened it up. Aha! Actually, this is a petition to remove you from being sergeant of arms. And you just signed your own petition. Oh, I... <laughs> I know, this is terrible. Like, I, no, it's not enough to just get a petition. No, you got to lie to me and get my signature on the thing. I, if you were here right now, you'd be going, oh, I'll do it for you. Oh, I know. I know, I've been in counseling ever since. I'm over it. Okay, I'm over it. <laughs> Mostly, I'm over it. But that's like, remind you of your failures. God gives grace. I love I love this. I'm sure you do too. God gives grace with love that has no boundary known unto men. It's just a beautiful thought. It's like Romans chapter 5 verse 8. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you when you were a sinner. God sent his son to seek and to save that which was lost. He said it's because it's the sick who need help. It's the lost who need to be found. 
It's like 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But notice this, would you? Right? It's God's heart. He says, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. However, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Would you read that with me? Because that's an amazing statement right there. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. However, if anyone sins, please know this. You have an advocate. Jesus is an advocate for sinners. With the Father, he advocates. He's like your representative to the Father. He intercedes in your behalf. That is an amazing, an amazing declaration of the heart of God. It says that he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours only, but also for the whole world. Very, very powerful. Here's what I'm trying to suggest to you. To counter the enemy's lies, you need the truth. Truth is a weapon of warfare. Hey, if lies are a weapon of spiritual warfare, then truth also is a weapon of spiritual warfare. To counter the enemy's lies, you need the truth because it's the truth that will set you free from the lie. A lie will keep you in bondage. A lie will keep you in chains. And it's the truth that will set you free from such. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, and we add verse 36. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, if you abide in my word, then you are truly, truly disciples of mine. And then, he says, then you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. And verse 36, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Stand in that truth, because in that truth is tremendous victory. Take hold of it. Now, notice this as we go back to Revelation 20. Please notice this. Let's apply this very specifically and very personally. Bind Satan in your life right now. This is very, very important. Bind Satan in your life right now. Though Satan seeks to destroy, though he is a liar, though he is a deceiver, you do not have to be defeated. You say, well, he's, he's greater than I am. Yeah, he's not greater than the Lord. We're going to look at that. See, there's greater victory in knowing who you are in Christ. Know who, you, it's the truth. Know who you are in Christ and that your victory is found in him. Know that. See, here's what I'm saying. You have authority in Christ to bind Satan from your life because he is in your life. All authority has been given to him, and he abides with you. I'll tell you, there's, there's much to be written, much to be said. It's a powerful point because let's apply it. Let's see it this way. Greater is he who is in you. Greater is he who is in you. My point is this. The church has authority to take a stand right now. In regard to spiritual warfare and the enemy's lies, the church has authority to take a stand right now. Back when Jesus said this to the disciples, a tremendous insight came out. He said, he said to his disciples, who do the people say that I am? Who do the people say that I am? And so they said, well, uh, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others still say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus then asked, but who do you say that I am? It was Peter who was the one who said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus responded. This is Matthew 16, verse 18. I also say to you that you are Petros, Peter, little rock. You are Petros, Peter. And I say to you this, upon this rock, I will build my church. And he's talking about the great rock, the testimony of who he is. And the gates of hell will not overpower it. The church, the gates of hell will not overpower the church. Now, here's what I want us to see. Look at this just for a moment. Gates 
are for defense, not offense. Gates are for defense. You don't have to go through life trying to outrun the gates of hell. The gates of hell are not pursuing you. Jesus is saying that the church will have authority to prevail over demonic forces. Because we know that the enemy comes to steal and to kill and destroy. But he says we can prevail. You can prevail because Christ is in you. Greater is he who's in you. James chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. Submit therefore to God. Submit to God, which is to say come under his authority. Because when you come under his authority, then his authority re re resides over you. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. That's the key to spiritual victory. Draw nearer to God. That's the key. Someone says, well, I'm not being victorious. Draw nearer to God. I want more victory in my life. Draw nearer to God and God draw, will draw near to you. See, God wants the church to be victorious. That's what he has in mind for the church. 1 John 4, verse 4. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because, and here's a great truth, a great promise, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That's a tremendous statement. This is the reason you have authority. This is the reason that you stand in victory because greater is he, Christ Jesus, who is in you than he who is in the world. Satan, the enemy, the liar. Here's another one. Romans chapter 8, verses 31, and then we add 33 to 34. What then shall we say to these things? Read the whole chapter. It's amazing. If God be for us, then who can be against us? That's a tremendous statement, a promise. Who can be against us if God be for us? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who's the one who condemns? Hey, his point is this. If you're standing in Christ, then you're standing in the victory. You're standing in the justification that God gives to you in Christ. Therefore, who can condemn you? Answer, no one, not the enemy either. Therefore, let's apply it this way. Keep growing spiritually. You want to be victorious spiritually? Here's the key. Keep growing spiritually. In regard to spiritual warfare, stand firm in your faith. This is the key. Stand firm. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 and 16. Therefore, he writes, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. You will be able, God will make you able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, then stand firm, therefore. Have you done everything to stand firm? If you have put on the full armor of God, having done everything to stand firm, then stand firm. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The lies are like flaming arrows that he sends your way. You can defeat all lies with the shield of faith, he says. Next, let me, let me put it from this perspective. Number one, stand firm in your faith, but number two, be victorious in your mind. This is a very important key, to be victorious in your mind. You want to be victorious, the battle oftentimes is in the mind, the thoughts, the way you perceive, the way you process, the way you understand, the way you perceive it. It's like the psalmist. This is the way I saw it until I come into the house of the Lord, and then I could see it differently. It's how you see the thing, how you process it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, though we walk in the flesh, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely, that means spiritually powerful, for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations in every, every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Be renewed in your mind. All right, next, keep growing. And number three, keep growing in Christ. 
Keep moving. Keep moving. Don't be stagnant in your relationship to the Lord. Do not be stagnant, because I'll tell you, stagnant water stinketh. Stagnant water gets bad, right? God is committed to transforming you into what you will become. God wants to keep doing a work. You're not done. God's not done. God's still doing a work. Keep moving. Keep moving. Don't become stagnant in your faith. Keep moving. Because God has a direction for your life. God has that which he will accomplish in your life. I was thinking of an illustration. In, back in the history, the long history of Israel, at one point when the Midianites were oppressing Israel, an angel came to one of the men of Israel who was hiding in a cave. And this Israel came it is to Gideon, and uh, the angel of God said to Gideon, who was hiding in the cave, Hail, O valiant warrior. <laughs> he most certainly was not a valiant warrior. But God saw who he would be. God saw who he would become. And he hailed him according to who he would become. Hail, O valiant warrior. A valiant warrior who would defeat the enemy. I tell you, God sees you the same. God sees you according to what you will be. God does not see you and define your life according to what you once were. That's what the enemy does. He is the liar. He likes to remind you of your past failures. God has for you and in store for you a future and a hope. And he will refer to you as that. I, I just love that great truth. Therefore, let me apply it this way. Therefore, walk in the ways of your king. Walk in the ways of your king. When you choose to live by God's ways rather than the ways of the enemy, you are binding Satan in your life. Let me say it again. When you choose, when you decide to walk in God's ways, Rather than the ways of the enemy, you are binding Satan in your life. You are binding his influence. See, God's ways and Satan's ways are absolutely opposite. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. God edifies and builds up. Be like your king. Be like your king. Don't be like the enemy. The, the enemy likes to accuse don't be like the enemy. Don't be an accuser. Don't be a criticizer. The Holy Spirit edifies, builds up. You be like the Lord. Edify, build up, bless. See, Satan is bound when you operate your life in a completely different way than those who are led by the ways of the world. Different, be different. Satan is bound when you operate your life different than the world because he's the, the influence of the world. Be different. Be like God. Revelation 12, verses 17 to 18 and verse 21. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. That's what the world does. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. They misapply scripture. Revenge for revenge. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. If someone spits in your face, you can spit right back. If someone cusses at you, you can cuss right back. If someone gets hot at you, you can get hot right back. Oh, oh, wait, that's the way the world is. You're in the kingdom of God now. A whole different set of principles apply. Be like your Lord. Respect, I'm still in Romans 12. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. And if possible, notice that, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the way of the Lord. Then James, James gives a list, a great list of those qualities of those who choose to live. Choose to live by the way of the one who is the victor, our Lord and Savior. Choose to live by his way. That's how you defeat the enemy in your life. 
James chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. The wisdom from above is, first of all, pure. Then it's peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is, this is victory. He's describing spiritual victory. When you walk according to your, the ways of your Lord, not according to the ways of the prince and the power of the air. See, God has in mind for you a tremendous transformation from what you once were to what you will be in Christ. Keep growing, keep drawing near, keep being steadfast in your faith, keep increasing in the things of the Lord. God is for you and he will build your life on that rock, on that foundation. Keep growing. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word and the promises of victory that are found in you. Lord, I pray for everyone who is hearing this message right now, wherever they may be. I pray that they would bind the enemy by choosing to walk closer, nearer to you. By walking in your ways with your heart. By abiding in the truth and being set free from the bondage of lies. Free your church. Bring victory to your church, Lord. And church, wherever you may be, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart right now and you are desiring that the Holy Spirit bring victory, you walk in that victory. Will you just acknowledge that to the Lord? Just lift up your heart to the Lord. You don't have to raise your hand. Just lift up your heart to the Lord and say, God, here I am. Do this work. I want to keep growing. I want to draw nearer to you. I want that victory. I want to be transformed. I want you in my life. Bind the enemy. Give me that victory, God. I want to walk in that victory. I want that truth to set me free. I want to build my life on that foundation. I want you. I want you in my life. Father, we thank you. We honor you. We stand in you and in your word. In Jesus' name, and everyone said church and amen and amen.